Today's readings include Psalm 23, one of the best known verses of Scripture in all of creation, right? And I'm always struck every time I hear or read that first verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, I would obviously say that I am a sheep of Jesus' fold, but I have an issue because I still want. Right? There's things I want all the time. Psalm 23 says, though, that if the Lord is my shepherd, I'm not going to want. So there's an issue there, right? But I have to ask, am I alone? Am I the only one that wants stuff? And I'm not saying need by any stretch of the imagination, right? Because we do know there's a definite difference between need and want. I want some stuff, right? We all want stuff if we're honest with ourselves. We want peace in the world. We want the end of terrorism. We want our lives to be easy. We want lots of money so we don't have to worry about anything. We want happiness. What else do we want? Health. Right? Healthy kids. We want our children to be healthy and happy. We want our loved ones to be healthy and happy. We want the things around us to be good. Right? We all want these kind of things. We want to know that God is always with us and that our faith is actually going to pay off. Right? And sometimes that's the question. Well, in today's Gospel reading, which you all did a wonderful job of this morning, by the way. Thank you for helping with that. Um, there are 16 questions in 42 verses. 16 questions. Right? Nine questions are asked of the blind man, three questions are asked of Jesus, two are asked of the blind man's parents, and two are asked of the Pharisees. In our lesson this morning, Jesus heals a blind man on the Sabbath. And this man was blind from birth. So everyone is asking questions, trying to understand how is it that this man who was born blind, has never seen anything, can now see everything around him. They're trying to explain what they cannot understand. The disciples ask Jesus, why, who sinned, this guy or his parents? The neighbors ask the blind man questions. The Pharisees ask the blind man questions. The, the blind man's parents questions. They ask Jesus questions. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus asks the blind man questions. There's all these questions flying around. And how many questions does it take to figure out what's going on? And who's actually right? And why did this man receive his sight? Isn't it pretty simple? Jesus spat on the ground, created mud, put it on his eyes, and told him to go wash it off. There you go. Why do we have to question it? Right? How many questions does it take? Have you ever been annoyed by somebody asking you questions? If you're a parent, you have to say yes. <laughs> I have this one little boy who will ever be ingrained in my mind. His name is Dougie. He was a, a student at the school where I was a pre-K teaching assistant. And I got to spend lots of time with Dougie. And Dougie always asked why. It didn't matter what you said or what you did. His question was always why. Dougie, you need to sit down. Why? Well, because we can't be running around right now. Why? Well, because we're trying to learn something. Why? Because that's why we're here. Why? 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 It just went on and on and on. And it was insatiable, right? He never stopped asking questions. It's beautiful. It's also annoying, right? You get to that point where you're like, can't you just take my answer and please just be quiet and sit down just for a moment? Let's move on so we can actually do something here, right? But that is what children do. They ask questions. They ask why. They ask, are we there yet? Right? How much longer? What does that mean? How do you know? Children question all of the reality around them and they wonder about things and ask about them. And that's the beauty of being a child, right? To question reality, to question everything that goes on around you. When you're a parent, it's not quite so nice when they question everything. But, you know, that's what they're doing. They're trying to learn about what's happening in the world. How many of us still wonder about things in a childlike way, but we're afraid to ask the question? I see some adults going like this, right? We're all still there. I would love to say that the need to question authority and to test the limits 
of our perceived reality stops in the early years of our adolescence. But like many others, at times I continue to need proof for statements of things that are made and things that are said around me. Right? We need to ask the question. We need to understand it. In our passage today, Jesus heals and causes a big stir because people can't understand what's just happened. And trying to explain this, they have to ask questions because they just don't understand it. Jesus came to give us faith and hope in the living Father who will turn what we know on its head and give us access to God the Father in heaven. But they doubted what they witnessed. They doubted what God was doing in their presence. And as I hear their questions about trying to figure out what happened, the doubt creeps in, and I'm reminded that doubt is a constant companion to faith. We think that doubt and faith are polar opposites and that they can't possibly exist in the same place at the same time. But they're not opposites. It's not opposite to have doubt when we live in faith. Right? Faith and doubt. All of us, absolutely, every day, experience doubt of some sort or another. Are we going to have enough money this month to pay our bills? Are our kids going to get good grades in school? You know, we all have those things that run through our mind. We doubt our abilities to overcome difficult situations. We doubt if we will make it through without succumbing to an old addiction. We doubt if our friends or parents are aware of how much pain we're in. We doubt God's presence in our lives and our connection to God. Right? Doubt and questioning are normal parts of our lives as people of faith. You see, we've come a long way. We've been, I've been here, we've been here now for three months. I'm probably going to cry, so just so you're all aware. I've been here now for three months, Right? But before that, what happened? You all went through a long process of trying to find a pastor. There were some things that happened, and your pastor left. And then you went through a process of going through that. Well, during that whole time, I was actually on leave from call. I've been looking for a call to pastor a congregation longer than you all have been without your permanent pastor. I resigned my last call in February of 2012 due to issues surrounding things that don't need to be discussed anymore. Stuff with the church. If you want to know that story, come and ask me and I'll tell you it. There's nothing to hide there. But it was a long process and even before that happened, I knew that I was going to be needing to look for some place. I've actually interviewed, before I got to St. John's Los I probably interviewed with over 70 different congregations in multiple states around this country. There's not probably, I know I was in at least 35 of the 65 synods of the ELCA interviewing with congregations. And at times that valley looked deep. And at times that valley looked long. And at times I didn't know how we were going to get out of it. And every day I believed that God was working in and through everything that was happening. And every day I doubted that there was ever going to be a congregation that we would be called to. So I believe wholeheartedly that faith and doubt are not opposites. That faith and doubt walk hand in hand. Thomas didn't. Thomas gives doubting a bad rap. It's not about doubting, it's about believing. You see, we can question everything that we have in our lives, but there's not a shadow of doubt in my mind that God still exists and God walks with me. Even when I don't know how it's going to end, even when I don't know what's going to happen between here and there, I know that God is always going to be walking with us. So it's not wrong to question, it's not wrong to doubt. It's not wrong to think about what's going to happen and then just fall back in the loving arms of God and go, I don't have a clue what's going to happen here, God, but I know that everything is going to be in your hands and that you're going to work everything out. Because that's what always happens. Right? God never gives us more than we can handle. Sometimes I just wish God didn't think I could handle so much and have so much faith in me. Right? It's just a reminder that we're never alone. That this journey that we're on is always one that we're walking with Jesus. And that's how we can absolutely pray the last line, which we all already said together, of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right? This phrase 
is sometimes misleading. It is good news, but it's misleading because goodness and mercy don't always follow us, right? It's not always good. But mercy and goodness is always following us, even though we can't see it. It's always right there. Even in the deepest, darkest places, God's always there with us. We just have to have faith in that. And God is big enough for you to doubt and ask those big questions. So never lose that childlike faith of asking why and trying to understand your faith better and grow in God because He is always going to be there. When you think that the only thing that is pursuing you is your problems, the evil and everything around you, remember that line of Psalm 23. God is pursuing you. He is right there behind you. He's always walking right behind you, ready to catch you when you fall. So God is always pursuing you. So live your life boldly and question so that you can grow closer to God and make your childlike faith grow.